Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation and thanks to the organisers, especially uh, for organising such a nice workshop conference. Um, I chose the title of Non-Perturbative Studies of Membrane Matrix Models, uh, primarily to focus on the fact that the physics that I'm interested in has to do with the matrix or the membrane aspect of these uh, matrix models and uh, to um, um, highlight that, uh, some other aspects of them, the non-perturbative studies of them, them I would focus on as well. The um, uh, starting point, which I believe was Jens's starting point when he began with uh, these uh, membrane models, was to start with the Nambu-Goto action. And the Nambu-Goto action is just the induced volume uh, uh, pulled back onto the membrane uh, from the uh, embedding, amb ambient embedding space. So we're pulling back the metric from some ambient embedding space with a metric little g, mn, onto uh, the surface, this p plus one dimensional surface called the p brain. Uh, one is meant to be time. And we pull it back to get, get an ambugoto action. The membrane could be charged in the same sense as that if this was p was zero, this would be the world line of some particle. And we could think that it's a charged particle. So we'd want to add a a uh, uh, the integral of some one form onto uh, uh, to uh, to that so that that it's uh, there's some electromagnetic potential. Uh, so in general, we'd be consider we want to consider uh, these the area with these additional p form uh, gauge fields. One could complicate these theories by adding some anti-symmetric part to the metric to get some dirac born enfeld action. It's of course very natural in some contexts to add extrinsic curvature. Uh, the focus for my uh, lecture will mostly be on supersymmetric, the supersymmetric version. Supersymmetry uh, restricts the uh, dimensions in which one can, and I will only be considering supersymmetric extensions of these charged Nambu-Goto strings or membranes. The, um, it's pretty clear that uh, there has to be a maximum dimension if we're going to deal with supersymmetric extensions because if we've got a spinner, a spinner's number of components grow exponentially uh, with the dimension of space-time, whereas the number of bosonic components only grows with the number of uh, space-time dimensions. So there has to be an upper limit. And then consistency, uh, there are special ward identities, so special fields identities that close the supersymmetry algebra only in these very special dimensions. These are one more than the maximal dimension for n equals one supersymmetry. So uh, 10 dimensions, this is 10 plus 1. So then you will see that are, there, you've already seen some of the relation between the, um, that and, uh, and the um, uh, matrix models. One could discuss it in polyca form, but that doesn't seem to lead to any additional insights. Uh, if I put in a Lagrange multiplier field, which I've considered, or Lagrange multiplier metric H, uh, one can integrate it back out. It looks more or less the same, but uh, it hasn't led to any additional insight into how to quantize these models. What seems to be successful, and uh, this was observed, the initial observation which made significant progress in these uh, was by uh, Jens, was to go to the light cone coordinates uh, the shield gauge in light cone co coordinates. So basically, one writes down the I'm taking the flat space met membrane, uh, flat space embedding, pull back the mem membrane, the metric onto the membrane, the sigmas uh, are the coordinates on the membrane. And uh, if you pull it back, you get this metric. 
if I choose the light cone coordinates, then and choose one of the, my time parameter tau to be x plus, then this, the thing that's special that happens here is that x minus dot only appears linearly here, and that, the fact that it's linear rather than quadratic plays a crucial role. Uh, if uh, one, one and one's choosing the shift gauge fixing so that the shift is zero, so uh, nj is set to be zero. This is an, an additional gauge fixing constraint. In this gauge fixed action, the Nambu Gota form takes the form of the, the product of these two terms. If one takes the momentum dld x minus, one sees that on the equations of motion, this is actually a constant. And the derivative with respect to dj of x minus doesn't appear anywhere. One has avoided the uh, dependence on this quantity. Uh, the in two dimensions, then the additional special ingredient that happens is that the determinant of a metric can be rewritten using uh, the determinant has two epsilon tensors. You can rearrange the two epsilon tensors so that you pull out something that looks like a Poisson bracket, and the potential that's left takes this form, and one ends up with the flat in the flat space Hamiltonian going from the Nambu Goto action to the Hamiltonian with an additional uh, Gauss law constraint. So this is the, the structure of, uh, of what's going on. And um, the, uh, the obvious thing then is to go in, going to the quantization uh, to replace this with, with uh, the uh, Poisson brackets with commutators. This looks, in looks like one should be able to make further progress and really quantize this system properly without uh, going to any non-commutative version of it. However, to the best of my knowledge, that has not been successful. I'm sure somebody here will, uh, will let me know if there's some promising uh, uh, progress on that. If we, one looks at higher dimensional objects, those are also of interest. The determinant now is going to have many more. Uh, it's going to still only have two epsilons. So we can pull out one of the epsilons and uh, attach it with derivatives of uh, these x's so to get something that now looks like the square of the Nambu uh, brackets. And the residual symmetry in, both, in all these cases is area-preserving diffeomorphisms. And this, is, this can be reformulated as gauge field theories of area preserving diffeomorphisms. I'll say a small little bit on that a little later. Quantization of these. How do we quantize them? The quantization involves, as uh, we heard from uh, in, uh, very nicely uh, this morning, is again to go to a non commutative version of these. One deforms the uh, uh, functions to matrices and the commutator or the Poisson bracket to commutators and the uh, momenta become just the Laplacian. So this is the Hamiltonian in quantum mechanical form and it's just a many body Hamiltonian with this peculiar potential. The potential you will note has several has these flat directions so there are directions going outwards where, where it's, sh it's uh, flat and becomes very narrow. Uh, in the bosonic setting, these are lifted, those flat directions are lifted by the zero point energy of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the fluctuations due to the other coordinates. However, that's not the case uh, in the uh, uh, supersymmetric version, which I'll come back to. Mm. Yeah. The, um, um, we have replaced the diffeomorphism invariance by a UN symmetry, and the Gauss law constraint uh, says that we should choose singlets. These are going to be UN singlets at the physical states. So, um, he, so this is this is the bosonic system. H is a matrix membrane or fuzzy membrane in d plus one dimensions. You'll see that at low energies, these flat directions. 
and all of the saddle points are given by these of the potential here are given by uh, these equations which we heard a lot about uh, in the second talk this morning these uh, 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 minimal surface equations an interesting quantity from the physics point of view is to study the partition function of such an object so the partition function would be z is trace of over the physical states of each of the minus beta h uh, where the physical states again means we're just focusing on un singlets path integral version uh, of this object here is to integrate over x go to the action associated with the Hamiltonian H, which is periodic in imaginary time. Uh, that integral, and then do a path integral over the, the x's, these now matrix versions of the uh, embedding coordinates. So the fact that the, the matrix versions means that somehow the embedding space itself should naturally have also been considered non-commutative object. Uh, and the Gauss law constraint is implemented by a Lagrange multiplier field, which is this gauge field A. Uh, and A, of course, is there's no curvature to, uh, to A. It's flat. We're in one dimension. There's the only physical degrees of freedom are the fact that A can have some values that you can't get, you can't undo because of the periodicity in time. So you can diagonalize them, but one could imagine that there was boom R enough flux through this time circle. And the, each of the, for each uh, component, if we diagonalize the matrix, each component of that uh, uh, can give rise to a flux which we can't get rid of. And those are the physical degrees of freedom of this matrix A. Uh, the exponential of A, e to the i times A, integrated around the closed path around that period was the Polyakov loop that uh, Kuai San uh, referred to this morning. So an interesting object uh, will be what's going on with the physics of the variable A. Uh, and just a small comment is that one can think of these bosonic matrix ones, you see this is, a, this is a dimensional reduction of Yang-Mills theory. If I take Yang-Mills theory in P dimensions, P, P spatial dimensions, I will be left with just one covariant derivative left. The commutators in the other direction will be, is, uh, are the only things that will survive. And we get, are going to get this here as being the zero volume limit of Yang Mills on a torus. So that gives us a hint as to well, some of the physics of what's going to go on here. We expect that the, uh, if it captures correct, the bosonic case is going to be captured by uh, the glue ball physics of Yang Mills theory. And that's exactly what happens, in fact. You get massive degrees of freedom for it. Um, one can consider the m these membranes embedded not just in flat space, but one consider, can consider other backgrounds. Uh, the back interesting family of backgrounds which preserve essentially all of the properties that I described already is to consider what are called PP wave uh, backgrounds. So PP wave, a parallel propagation wave uh, in a given space-time deforms the metric by this potential in along one of the uh, uh, light cone directions, this x plus plus. So there's a v which enters here. When I go through the exactly the same procedure, pull back my metric onto this space, quantize it, we, it induces a potential which is given by this potential here uh, into the Hamiltonian of the system. So we see how to, how to deform it in rather nice ways, uh, which can be quite useful. An interesting and special case, which I am going to focus on, 
and, uh, and it, many, it has many subcases which, uh, which we can uh, um, we can consider is when the potential ha is for this BMN matrix model. It basically it chooses. I should have written down the uh, the potential. You can you can see from this blue one up here, part up here, and uh, this uh, this part here, what the potential is. This cubic one here is coming from the fact that we require a, a three-form gauge field as well um, in, the, in the model. We, we have to turn on for consistency, we have to turn on the, uh, uh, one of these three-form fields. It has to be charged. The, uh, they, there's a slightly different factor between the xi, i is equal to 1 to 3 and a is equal to uh, uh, four to nine. When mu is zero, one gets the rid of this term, this term, this term, and this term, and one can absorb all of the indices into into one. I don't need to split, spill them out. The and it, this becomes what is known as the BFSS model, which is uh, which I think uh, was certainly presented by uh, Dewitt, uh, Hoppe, and Nikolai uh, prior to that. And it was originally discovered, I believe, in the early 80s in, by people uh, uh, trying to extend uh, supersymmetric quantum mechanical gauge theories, just playing with, uh, with uh, the Q operators and, and squaring them with trying to get maximal supersymmetry in that setting in quantum mechanics. Uh, but this is the model. You will notice as well that it, uh, I've these colored terms here, if I regroup them t together, these SO3 terms, there it has S the model has SO3 cross SO6 symmetry. It's extended to SO9 symmetry if I, um, if I set mu to zero. Uh, the psi's are the uh, are Majorana vial spinners, there are 16 component spinners. The model has 16 supercharges. Uh, so it's, and it, these, the, the spinners, uh, Psi is only is the transpose of them, of the, uh, the one. I'll say more on this in a minute. The um, minima, the configuration has rather special minima, aside from just the trivial uh, minima where x i are zero, uh, it has minima where xi are mu times li, where li are SU2 generators, not necessarily irreducible. Any reducible representation will give, give this object here. If I look at, and these are what are referred to as fuzzy spheres, we've heard about them already. If I look at the Dirac sector of this, which people won't usually do, you will see that if I focus on the fuzzy sphere sector, we get our standard time derivative. We get the psi transpose gamma li with a minus i three over four times that. If you compare that with the standard fuzzy sphere, standard Dirac operator on the fuzzy sphere, well, it has a gamma i li plus one. There's a slight difference. This is these are not masses on the fuzzy sphere. So the, the Dirac fermion has not become massive. In fact, it, uh, it has, it's a spin C. There's a s an additional coupling to the uh, spin connection. So that's, what, that's what's happening in these settings. Okay. It'd be interesting to explore that, going a little bit more on what's going on there. I, if I just go back, if I just take the first line here, and focus on one on this aspect of it here. You see that it, I, if I do take mute to be large, I can forget about these terms. Uh, I should keep this. I can forget about all these cubic interactions. It just becomes a Gaussian model. So, but it's a supersymmetric Gaussian model. I'll return to to its structure again in a second. But um, let's focus first of all on what the properties of a gauge Gaussian model are. This is just a harmonic oscillator, 
a matrix harmonic oscillator and we are demanding that uh, the physical states of these are the singlets. You are not allowed to consider non-singlet states. They're not on physical states. There's a Gauss law constraint. That Gauss law constraint is implemented by this uh, gauge field. Uh, the physics of this, let's see, is that if we focus at very high temperatures, let's, if we focus at very high temperatures, well, this kinetic theorem, we can Fourier transform it. It's got a zero mode here, so only the potential will, will survive. We're left with just matrices, pure matrices, pure Hermitian matrices. Those pure Hermitian matrices uh, are each will have a spectrum of a Wigner distribution. Uh, sorry, but it will have one other ingredient. It will the commutator of Xa with Xi will survive as well. It'll be the dimensional reduction once more of this. So we will just left with the time derivative will disappear and this will be reduced to just the commutator. We'll get a factor of beta in front. In practice, what it will have it means is that the eigenvalues of Xi are Wigner distributed. Uh, at t equals zero, just to go back to it, at t equals zero, there is the periodicity is irrelevant. That gauge field, there is no loop to put our Mariela, Ma, Bon Arnoff fluxes in. A becomes irrelevant, so we can set it to zero, to zero uh, or uniform. So A can be gauged away. The, uh, at high temperatures, A again is going to behave like a pure matrix and it will be localized. It will be localized, its eigenvalues will be governed roughly by a Wigner distribution. So we get a Wigner distribution for the eigenvalues near, near zero uh, for A. At zero temperature, its gauge weight becomes flat, so the eigenvalues have to undergo some tra phase transition. They're, they won't cover the circle at high temperatures, they cover the circle at low temperatures. There's a point of non-analyticity when they start to cover the entire circle. That is a Hagedorn type transition. It's when the constraint is, not, uh, is no longer that relevant. And that occurs at a temperature, which one can evaluate exactly as Tc as m over the log of p. So we need more than one matrix for this to exist. Uh, but two matrices, we're going to get Tc as m over log of two. The transition can be observed in the, uh, it can be observed as a center symmetry breaking the Polyakov loop. What happens is that the Polyakov loop, if, if we look, uh, it's easy, it's, the Polyakov loop uh, goes down and it goes to, hits one, one half and then hits, goes to zero suddenly. If one looks at the eigenvalue, there's a dis jump discontinuity in the Polyakov loop. Or if one looks at it in terms of the eigenvalue distribution, rho of A as a function of lambda, the eigenvalues, as we increase to zero, <coughs> 0 to 2 pi, they reach this critical value. Oh, it should go up to it. It's meant to be normalized to have, a, to have 1. And then after that, they become the uniform distribution. There's a sharp transition to a uniform distribution. This is the transition type of transition that occurs here. It is a, one of the characteristic transitions that occur in matrix model. It is, there's another very famous one, which is a gross witten transition. It is not that particular transition, the gross witten one. <coughs> it, is a, it is a different transition. The gross witten one actually corresponds to the Polyakov loop going down continuously. 
and it's the square of the Polyakov loop that uh, exhibits the transition. I want to focus on the tree matrix model sector, just to flash back. I want to focus on this setting here of these three matrices, but I'm going to actually not... I uh, one of the features we will see not, that occurs in the non-perturbative physics of this model is that there are fuzzy spheres that emerge because of the balance between the uh, bosons and the fermions. There can be transitions to fuzzy spheres. This, this symmetry is not exact if you integrate out the fermions. There's no reason to believe that you, have a, a, you still have this quadratic symmetry. There can be other linear terms that are induced, or cubic terms that are induced. So I'm going to choose a three matrix model. Uh, and study three or three? Three. <laughs> okay. but purely bosonic. Purely bosonic. No. This is a toy model now to exhibit some other features that are going on in this, and you will see in the full model how this, this plays a role in this, some the physics related to this plays a full role, plays a role. So I've called them D and I've normalized it slightly differently. Uh, and because I want to, I want to take beta out here in front and I've pulled it out so that, uh, so that the Ds are minimized. Uh, D, the minimum values have the LAs rather than some mu times LA. So D has a minimum, if you look at the minimum, the extreme of this value here, then the minimum of this energy arises when D is equal to LA, and it arises when LA is the maximum distribute, uh, max, the maximum irreducible representation allowed for uh, for the matrix, for the representation LA. So LA is the size, has, uh, has dimension, the size of the, uh, the dimension of the representation is the size of the matrix. Uh, if you plug that back in here, you see that this is going to become a quadratic Casimir. This will also become a quadratic Casimir and the overall energy is negative. So the, the, because the overall energy is negative, the, the, uh, hence the maximum uh, representation is the one that gives the, the one. And I've written down the ground state energy here. It's E is minus N squared minus 1 over 48. And you plug it into that. Now, if I consider this as a statistical mechanical model, so we we've, Z is, now I'm just taking it zero dimensional one, integrating over the Ds, E to the minus beta times this energy functional. If I take very large uh, temperatures, you expect that this cubic term is not going to play that much of a role. The energy levels are going to go up and up. We've got some, uh, we've got some wells here, some quadratic type of, we've got some relatively flat wells. That they're, they're a little bit distorted because of the cubic, but once we go up at high energies here, fluctuations at high energies, the dominant term should be the quartic term. So again, we expect at high, uh, at temperatures, at high beta, that uh, the dominant distribution here is going to be uh, Wigner semicircles for the Ds. Low beta, you mean? At low beta, yes, sorry. <laughs> low beta, yes. Low beta, high temperature, low beta. Uh, the dominant uh, physics is going to be uh, Wigner semicircles. However, at large beta and low temperature, the uh, dominant physics should be the ground, uh, associated with this ground state. So we expect to see some sort of phase transition between these two. And this is a phase transition where there's a geometrical phase that emerges, right? or that emerges as you cool the system down. You get a condensate, which is a fuzzy sphere in its maximum distribution. One can simulate it. This is a it should be possible to analyze this uh, system analytically. I'll show you that the, some program, you can get the res essential results analytically, but uh, uh, this is a sim numerical simulation of it. If you take the expectation value of the action, the internal energy is just S. Uh, there are two, clearly two phases with a jump between them. The specific heat, which is 
the standard deviation of this energy, uh, it has a characteristic phase at um, there's a high temperature phase and a low temperature phase and just to get it right beta is alpha to the 4 alpha is large so this is the low temperature phase as we heat the system up the fluctuations of the fuzzy sphere get larger and larger it explodes in some sense and then disappears into a uh, just collapsed uh, eigenvalue distributions. It collapses is what it does. It, it has goes into goes larger and larger fluctuations and collapses. Uh, these the eigenvalues. One can look at the eigenvalues of one of the matrices D three, the commutator of two of them. There's a little distortion here in these things, which are partly due to the fact that these are each one of these is a Gauss, is a Wigner distribution in its own right and you're measuring these ones and uh, not every one of them have the exactly the same occupancy so and this is in the uh, high temperature phase uh, the again a Wigner distribution essentially if one, to analyze this, one can try and uh, analyze it by just looking at an effective potential for, the, for taking uh, dA to be phi times LA. Phi is just a, 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 phi will be a potential. It's essentially the radius of the fuzzy sphere. It's related to it. And if we take out the, if we calculate the effective potential and I've normalized it by pulling out overall power of n squared, uh, we get beta, a phi to the 4 from the commutator squared term, a phi cubed, and bec from the van der Maand, because uh, one should gauge fix this, there's a, there is a log of phi squared that, uh, that plays an essential role. This is, can, you can view this as coming from the fact that if I diagonalize one of the matrices, there's a van der Maand in there, so there's a log of uh, the eigenvalues of that matrix. The eigenvalues of that matrix are proportional to phi times some values that differ. The phi comes out, and it, it plays a role in the, when we take it up into the exponential, it gives us a log of phi. Uh, when we keep track of all of those, those factors. So this is the effective potential for it. Uh, the location of the minimum, well, it tells us that there should be a critical value. Beta C is 8 over 3 cubed. It also tells us that there's a characteristic divergence of the exponent of the specific heat, which is alpha, and that is 1 half. And those match uh, excellently with uh, the numerics. So this, is th this little model is capturing the essential features of the, uh, of the phase transition rather, rather well. Uh, so if I, from, that one, uh, from that effective potential, one can derive that uh, S is equal to 5 twelves as the transition is approached from the fuzzy spheres side, and S is 3 quarters on the other side. So there's a jump in this internal energy, a rearrangement of it. What was the definition of S? S was the expectation value of the action. It's the internal energy. It's a bad name for it, really. Uh, so there's a jump in the internal energy. And the divergence of the specific heat is giving this. Uh, on one, one, I, I didn't try uh, superimposing the plots, but you can see it in some of my references. Uh, they, it works quite well. So let me go back to make some comments on uh, these membranes, back to membranes. Just keeping. How about the uh, other fuzzy spheres? Are there other fuzzy sol solutions of, um, of other fuzzy solutions of the equations? Have you it tried any kind of. So you did the fuzzy spheres, right? In this case. For the, the toy model? Uh, I suppose. The toy model has all of these solutions that uh, we heard this morning. But they are saddle points. They are not. 
They are not. They are. They are. They are saddle points. They are not the minimum of the, the energy functional. They are. They are. They satisfy the equations. Uh, they satisfy. I mean, the 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 potential is just uh, this x a x b squared, and there's a trace of this, and then there's a cubic term uh, x epsilon x b. So this this one here will give you your commutator of uh, the x's. Uh, uh, and this one here is going to give me uh, it has some commutator um, there's some plus an epsilon times an x x um, is zero <coughs> you have some matrices there right they're matrices yeah so but how you construct them I mean is it dependent on the particular they're random matrices in the model, they are random matrices, but if you want to, if you want to find solutions to these equations, then. Uh, but maybe the question so at yeah. low temperature, when you say x goes to L, yes, which L? There is a moduli space of L. No, then they, it goes to the, la in the in that case, it goes to the largest one. In the per little mo in the model that I gave, it went to the largest one because that has much lower energy than any of the others. The energy is going to minus infinity. Not, uh, it does not. Continuous symmetry, I mean, it has to go somewhere. There is not a Mexican hat potential in the L direction. No, the, the, it, it, the symmetry just uh, is the symmetry that rotates the, uh, the, these, uh, these matrices LA. But they are all the one. They are just, uh, uh, you have LA, and if I do a U, U dagger, this will be an RAB times LB. Yeah, but just you know, we are covering all of them at low temperature. The model is uh, the model covers distributed. Over. Yes, I mean th this. This is a symmetry of the model yes. that a joint symmetry. Um, Which is never broken. It, that is never broken. Uh, it's never broken. It. It's the same as it, it's the same as rotational symmetry of the continuum model. Yes. Yes, it's more interesting. Right. Anybody? It, it it is related to a residual gauge symmetry associated with uh, the fluctuations around that of those backgrounds. Right. So uh, I want to go back to supersymmetric membranes. Um, and again, as I mentioned, they only exist in four, five, seven, and eleven dimensions. And uh, when we are expanding around flat space, there are um, dimensional reductions of supersymmetric Yang Mills in one dimension lower. There's the fermionic uh, symmetry of the model. There's a kappa symmetry, which plays an essential role if one wants to construct the model on and ensure that it is consistent on a generic background geometry. Ah, thank you. He just okay. survived. <laughs> That's excellent. The, uh, the Kappa symmetry says that, um, that the only consistent background, only consistent uh, backgrounds on which we can define these models are solutions of, a, of the supergravity, so of the corresponding supergravity. So 11-dimensional supergravity for the brains that I'm in, the, this BMN model, and uh, any, uh, and this M2 brain, any solution that you can define it on, it has to be a solution to uh, supergravity to define the background for that. Uh, aside from that, anything goes. Um, the, uh, and I'm, saying, I'm saying this is reminiscent of, of uh, the sigma models uh, having to satisfy a beta function uh, being zero. And I, I'm wondering whether in the type 2b model, if there was some, the kappa symmetry 
uh, was mentioned this morning as well. But I'm wondering if there's a similar requirement for from the supergravity that the type 2b model should only be defined on solutions of the supergravity. I expect that there is. But. Um, so and again, the BFSS model was that when it was on the flat space. Uh, it's often thought of as a system of ND0 brains. And it, this is a particularly interesting model uh, in that it's the simplest model and many people have um, attempted to construct the ground state wave function for this and various other aspects of it. One of the nice aspects of it is that it should, it looks like it should have a uh, well-defined partition function. The zero modes associated with this potential and the fact that we've exact zero uh, exact symmetry suggests that it may be slightly pathological. Uh, however, if we look at the fermions, the 16 fermions, and quantize them, they are uh, in their real objects, they satisfy some Clifford algebra of their own in their own right. They, if I take one of them, it carry it's uh, just one for. Uh, it defines a Hilbert space of two hundred and fifty-six dimensions. However, even though these objects satisfy are SO nine invariant, because they they mix between creation and annihilation operators under SO9, the, this 256 dimension representation cannot be reducible. It must be irreducible. It, it cannot be irreducible, it must be reducible. And if you break it up under, the, uh, uh, under SO9, it breaks up as the 44, 84 and the 128. And the 44 uh, identifies with the graviton the 84 with the anti-symmetric tensor and the gravitino of 11-dimensional supergravity. So one can see that the fermionic sector is again hinting that it wants back the 11-dimensional uh, uh, supergravity. And there was a nice attempt at building the ground state by Jens and collaborators uh, using some of these ideas. Uh, the BFS model uh, as I said, is uh, dimensionally reduced um, Yang Mills. Psi, this is the action for it. Now I've called it Psi rather than Theta because this is a, just a classical uh, Grassmann variable and we're doing a path integral over it. A psi is, a is generically a 32 component, but one can, uh, there, but it has uh, only 16 non zero components. And it's under spin nine. Uh, Eleven dimensional supergravity. I probably don't need to uh, to say anything about about that. Oh, sorry, we're going back. Um, the solution to eleven dimensional supergravity that's meant to be dual to this. There's an, an, an additional story that's going on here, in that uh, as you go to strong coupling for this matrix model, it should have a gravity dual. The gravity dual uh, has been exhibited and it should correspond to this geometry. It should co correspond to incoincident D0 brains of type 2a theory. If one says, well, what do incoincident D0 brains look like in type 2a theory? One can solve for them and one gets a harmonic function here for H Oh, which is this object and this metric. And I've lifted it to 11 dimensions here on the NM theory circle. Uh, the, uh, if I include temperature in this setting, the, there should still be a dual. And temperature should be the, uh, correspond by, uh, be to matching a Hawking temperature of the system. So we match the Hawking temperature with the uh, uh, temperature of the physical system of our matrix model, and we look for black hole solutions. Th that instability associated with the flat directions has been argued to be associated with Hawking radiation. 
I'm not completely convinced of that, but they, it, there's a, a suggestion uh, uh, by Hanada and collaborators to, to this effect. <coughs> and they've presented some evidence of it. This fucking temperature, uh, you, you try to include black hole, or it comes beforehand, or after you include the black hole? Means I didn't understand. No. The statement is that the, the matrix model is the matrix model. Uh, that matrix model, you can extract the physics of that matrix model by going to a dual theory. The dual theory is 11-dimensional supergravity. That 11-dimensional supergravity, because you are dealing with the matrix model at finite temperature, is a uh, finite temperature solution of supergravity. And the finite temperature in the supergravity setting is the Hawking temperature of a black hole. So you have matched the parking temperature of a black hole to the physical temperature of your matrix model, and you claim the two, they should agree if the conjecture is correct. Except you were looking at a BPS solution with zero temperature. I showed you the BPS solution. Yes. So you that was, that's at zero sim temperature. Yes. So that was just putting a BPS solution in a box in the temperature. Yes. It has to be that. When you turn the temperature d uh, d to uh, zero, you get that BPS solution. When you t turn the temperature up, you have a black hole solution. Hopefully, you don't. Yeah, no, no. Well, you you do because because you can exhibit it. So there's a solution, and this is a, a BP. This is a non-BPS. It's a black hole solution. And it turns out to be rather trivial to write it down in that you just put in dilation factors associated with the black hole, this F. Okay. Previous one was BPS solution. Previous one was BPS, and the previous one is corresponds to F equals 1 here. And now you claim, ah, this is the one that describes the dual at finite temperature. If I'm in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, in the strong coupling regime. Okay, so this, uh, and the prediction is that the temperature is related to the surface gravity, the usual way. Uh, we extract it, I make the identification, take the area over 4G for your entropy, get the energy, and the claim is, oh, the energy has to go like T to the 14 fifths. Right. And you can go and say, let me imp get improvements on this. Well, we've put it on a computer and other people have put it on a computer and the uh, best results are Berkowitz and uh, collaborators. Hanad is, is part of that collaboration. Um, and no, this is the result of numerical simulation. This is the result of numerical simulation. That's right. okay. we, and these are the error bars on it. The first one here, well, uh, it's been, I mean, they, they've, they've fed these in, I think, in, in this one to get, uh, and the errors are on the subsequent ones, but there's, there's a rather comprehensive analysis and checks as to how you, how you compare these. If you don't feed the parameter in, you, and you just feed the exponent, you get a good value, corresponding value for the new coefficient. If you feed the coefficient in, you don't feed the exponent in. If you don't feed the exponent in, it becomes quite difficult to get it. So it's... I feel it's consistent. It's consistent, but is, is it convincing? Well, I prepare, I've uh, prepared far too much here uh, because I wanted to uh, check the show you checks on the geometry in the next 10 minutes. So sorry, lambda, lambda is uh, what thing is like, is it? Lambda. Lambda was the coupling constant. Is it small or large? Uh, it's large. So it goes to infinity? Uh, well, actually, you can set it to one. It, it, it plays no real role because the temperature, the only uh, the t over lambda is the only variable here. So set lambda to one and forget about it. But t is large. T is small. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it gets <laughs> gets confusing, right? <laughs> so it's near zero temperature is uh, when uh, uh, is where the difficulties arise, and that's when, and that's the strong coupling limit of the theory. Okay. The, uh, this set of dual ideas um, allows us to explore things a little bit more comprehensively because one can say, well, let me add probes to this scenario. 
Uh, if I add probes to this scenario, I could consider uh, it put an M5 brain probe, or D4, a D4 brain probe. Uh, so the idea is to add, to consider the previous system was a D0 system. Let me consider adding D4 brain probes to it. So that I'm going to add a small number of them that, so that they won't change the geometry, but they will be able to act as probes on it. So uh, the number of uh, D zeros is large, the number of D fours is small and finite. E two, you have to change your matrix model to ch to incorporate that effect, uh, those ones, and you add these phi's to it, uh, and this is uh, these D is. Um, amount to quadratic terms in the phi's and the x's. But what it's meant to do is, just let's just focus a little bit on the physics of it. What it says is you put in a D4 brain and now I can put it into this geometry. Right, so I put the D4 brain, I can embed it. The, the, the background geometry has a black hole in the middle uh, somewhere and now we have, we're going to put in a four-dimensional surface that four-dimensional plane sur or surface, it can cut the black hole here. It could be just barely touch it, or it mightn't, uh, it mightn't intersect with it at all. The suggestion is to calculate the uh, free energy of this D4 brain. And it's the D4 brain is meant now to be described by a Nambu-Goto action of its own, right? A more generally, a dirac born infeld one, but in this case, it's just a Nambu-Goto action, where you pull back the geometry of the, this solution, and you calculate properties of that quantity. And for instance, as we vary this separation, the derivative of this uh, separation, as we vary it, we get a condensate. We can measure uh, quantities that are uh, that are observable so of the, uh, the theory. So, ma is this quantity derivative of uh, the uh, action with respect to ma. This is a matrix action, so we know how to take the derivatives, and we can compare these two, and we can, this when we get a prediction for it. This one gives us a prediction for the expectation value of, uh, uh, of that as a function of the surface. And if one works out what it is, as it one varies the uh, mass parameter, it gives us this particular curve. The curve is uh, universal in the sense that uh, for any temperature, the uh, you, all of the, all temperatures should fall onto this particular one if you scale things correctly, and <coughs> numerical simulations of that particular scenario agree quite well with it. It has uh, this is the point where the embedding no longer intersects the black hole. Uh, it's it intersects the black hole and it's a maximal intersection. Um, yeah, I wanted to go back to describe, uh, describe a little bit of the BMN model. I have a few minutes left. Five minutes. So I'm going to be relatively quick. So the BMN, just to remind you, it had a metric with this potential in the PP wave scenario. This is the V that I described. And it has this tree form gauge field, this constant tree form gauge field, which lives on x1, x2. This is not meant to be a bigger x3, it's just, it's, and, and x plus. And it's a constant field strength. So that's the scenario. It induces this change in the Hamiltonian of the system. And to remind you of the action again, I've written it here, colored it a little bit differently, because I want to focus on the large mu limit of this. So now if I'm going to take large mu, lar that the advantage of these PP waves is that they allow us to take large uh, potentials 
and to analyze those. The large mu limit uh, gives us, if I focus in on it in the large mu limit, you see it's just the supersymmetric Gaussian model. You might say, well, it doesn't look very supersymmetric because the fermions of, of mu over four and the, uh, the uh, bosons have mu over six and mu over three. However, if you check it, it is supersymmetric. It does have exactly the, the supersymmetry of the system. This one, this model, has a phase transition for the gauge field that's entering in here. Uh, um, now, this is supposed to be uh, describing a membrane as well. If I went back to the original membrane, and I didn't write it out in gory detail, but I just focused on the bos a bosonic membrane, a bosonic one, it would look like the analog one before going to this quantum version would look like this, where this, this is uh, this omega square root g object, uh, and the gauge field of uh, these diffeomorphisms is this omega. Uh, so one can ask, well, where, well, what's going to happen? What's, what does the physics of the phase transition correspond to? Should this model here have a phase transition? This is a Gaussian model with diffeomorphism invariance. Uh, it looks like it doesn't have a phase transition in that there is the analog of omega seems not, I mean, as far as I can tell, it has no phase transition. So what that's suggesting is that the matrix models really only describe one phase of they, they seem to be very close to the membrane. The supersymmetric version seem to be very close to this membrane. However, they probably only describe one phase of it. And uh, that should be the phase above the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the deconfined phase, the high temperature phase of the model. These guys uh, did some further analysis. Once you've got a massive, um, once you've got a Gaussian thing that you can expand around, it's very natural to do uh, higher order expansions. And as you see, they did a lot of work. They went up to order lambda squared, and they found TC to behave like this. They found a nice series. It's going to go larger. If you plot the, this series, you see, it, well, it's going to break down. It goes to zero here goes through zero at mu equals uh, 5.5. Five. Uh, the supergravity prediction, our colleagues in Portugal did some nice work uh, connecting the uh, black hole solution to with a small mu dependence, linear in mu. They found, they found the linear mu dependence. This is from the gravity dual prediction, and it gives some linear thing here. So they putting the two of them together, they look like that. So we would like to match them. Uh, the obvious thing to, uh, to me, it seems to be, is just, well, let's see, once you've got a nice series, what a physicist will do is they, they say, well, let me see if I can paddy approximate and get the other end. If it's going linearly, then I have a reasonable idea of what's going on. So. Rearranging this into some petty approximants uh, gives you something like this, where these, are, these numbers enter in here. And if you plot the petty approximant, well, I've, I've, I've told you it goes linearly here, and I've deduced what the linear coefficient is. It predicts that the linear coefficient should be this, which is actually not bad for such a short series. So it might give you some belief that the, the phase transition in the holonomy does behave Go like that. Yeah. It's not a spurious paddy pole here. Yes. There's no, there doesn't seem like there's any spurious paddy pole. The paddy is the purple thing. Just the paddy is this. But the gravi supergravity tells us that there should be a linear one here. So we, once I know that it should be linear there, I put that into my paddy. Yes, right. And it gives you this. Okay? It, it tells me I can try and improve this. So it's, 
suggests that it's well worth going to a higher order in this series. Uh, so we can do, then do some uh, numerical analysis of this, a non-perturbative phase diagram for it. These are uh, physical measurements put on a supercomputer uh, and looking at the Polyakov loop and where it's undergoing a transition. So it's not that far out, not terrible. It says that it's probably, there's a lot more going on here. Uh, there's a Myers term, this is the cubic term here, following the expectation value of that quantity. Uh, it seems to do its own thing a little bit and come in into it here. Uh, these are the two of them put together. And they seem to merge around here and then go back on towards the supergravity solution. Uh, yeah, that's probably... So in detail, what's going on? Uh, just since one has done numerical simulations, one can see, well, what's happening is that as one goes, on in de in as one decreases the temperature for a given mu, these fuzzy sphere phases emerge. Uh, so you can see the fluctuations. These correspond to different representations of SU2 and for the x's, these are all nine x's are plotted here. Uh, six of them are lying down here, and three of them just break out. And this is Monte Carlo time. So this is as the as the system is generating new random configurations. It jumps in here. Some of them collapse back down, down again, back up. So these flu fluctuating fuzzy spheres. Uh, that one was at uh, mu equals this and this one, and this quantity here is, uh, this is at a much lower temperature. It has settled down into one of these. What happens is these ones are fluctuating near, this is near the transition where these fuzzy spheres emerge. Once, it, once you cool it down further, these fuzzy spheres settle out onto this particular one. And as you see, they're, they're very happy with what, they ha what they're getting. The eigenvalue density is, there's no uh, indication that it's spreading to, the, uh, uh, to cover the unit circle. Whereas here, it's, it has, it's, this is gapped. And this is after something closer to a, a, a um, Gross Witten type transition in this this home. It didn't it hasn't gone flat, as you see. This is anything but flat, but it's a. Uh, so that's that's what what that one got. So that's when you have the two, the pink and the blue on the upper right. So yes, you said uh, you go on the blue the sphere. What about the pink one? Sorry, this is no this one is the fuzzy sphere. These are these these are. Is the pink thing below? They are the other matrices. There are nine matrices, three of them live ah, up okay. here, and two. six of them are down here. So six of them are fluctuating around zero, and three of them are fluctuating around non-zero, okay. which corresponds to a particular fuzzy sphere configuration. Okay. Right? Um, and but the reason that I focused on this one is that <laughs> this is the value at which the holonomy covers the unit circle. So that's the second transition. There, there really are two transitions, not one. <coughs> and possibly three transitions, in fact. So this is the part what the Polyakov loop looks like in that the, the Myers transition. Uh, and the two of them, uh, if you look at what's happening in the energy, not that noticeable. If I go to smaller value of mu, something similar happens. <laughs> but the two transitions appear to have occur more or less together, as the, the, two, the transitions seem to merge. And uh, this is what's happening in the uh, energy. There's a relatively clear jump in the energy here. And now the Polyakov loop is undergoing some significant rearrangement. Um, that has to do with the fact that the, um, the constraint on two singlet states is quite different around the background with, uh, with um, uh, SU2 Casimirs than it is around zero. 
Uh, the bosonic model for this, recently we've looked at the bosonic model. It is relatively boring in comparison. It has no fuzzy spheres because of this, the bosonic version, it has just this quadratic, this complete square potential. It does, however, ha have two phase transitions. Uh, one corresponds to the eigenvalue distribution becoming uh, non-gapped. The second corresponds to when that uh, distribution becomes flat, when the polycoff loop becomes flat. Uh, some conclusions and Thank you for your attention. I'll leave you. Read the. Oh, I should. I, oh, I, should, I should actually, because I yes. say something about the conclusions. Yes. Yes, because uh, I have wanted to make some comments as well that are. Um, so we look. We have uh, seen uh, these uh, me membrane matrix actions in models in action, so to speak. The uh, BMN model, uh, the plane weight matrix model. Right. It's very rich. Uh, with both emergent geometry in the form of fuzzy spheres and confining, deconfining phase transitions. Uh, the models, these models have gravity duals that predict their strong coupling behavior, and that seems to work. Uh, there's much overlap with the large in reduction that we heard this morning. Um, saddle points of the bosonic action, well, they can be quite interesting. They're I, uh, the comment here uh, really has to do with where are they likely to be interesting in, uh, in this setting and why would I still encourage people to put effort into them. Well, there's another topic that I didn't touch on at all here. It's called large in resurgence. There are the surgeon, this topic of resurgence. And in that setting, it t says that all of the saddle points are important and that you can extract more information if you know those saddle points, that the properties around one saddle point influence those around another, and that you can, you can extract a lot of information from, those, from that. So there's, uh, I, I would say the, the topic, that to, uh, the place to uh, try and make contact is what's called resurgence in this setting. Uh, the question, uh, well, can one find a background independent formulation of string theory is one of the questions you often hear in string, th string theory setting. Well, the same question really arises here in that, well, we've, we had to choose a background. We chose a flat background or PP wave background. What is the, uh, the difference? Uh, Kwai San told us this morning that he thinks that actually if I work around the flat background, I may be able to get everything. That, I that that's, that's certainly one way of, uh, of of approaching it, and uh, that would be nice. These models have a countable number of degrees of freedom, uh, which is quite nice. And as uh, Harold told us, and I agree with his, his thing, you know, I, I don't think you should need a, an infinite number of degrees of freedom. A s one a finite number of degrees of freedom per Planck length should be quite sufficient. We should be able to do any physics we need to do with, with that. And, these, things are, these models are very close to string theory, uh, and I would say well, the big difference is that they cut the multiverse part on that structure. They, they cut the, all of that uh, strangeness. They don't, because they have a finite number of degrees of freedom, that aspect of it, of it cannot be there. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Thank you. mm -hmm. So, yeah, so maybe I just didn't understand properly, but these, these phase transitions and so on, do they have an implication for some kind of emergent geometry, uh, this analysis of these models? Or yes, they, they do. That, they, I would say that's a significant point of what I was trying to uh, right. make. So maybe then I didn't get it. So, so what's the implication? Well, the implication is that emergent geometry should emerge in a phase transition, that it is likely to emerge it, it, from a physics point of view, there is a very, if I've got a large number of degrees of freedom that, um, get, that reorganize in a drastic way, that, should, that is really a phase transition. It would be very, it's surprising if it cannot be well approximated by thinking of it as a phase transition. 
it might be just a crossover, but it, it, it's useful to think of it as a pace transition in many sense. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, what about Among uh, now, I got lost after uh, um, <laughs> many interesting results. In some of them, did you explicitly uh, quantize using Clifford algebra the, the, the fermions? I mean, uh, I mean I see Jens did. Not that, no, that. In here for the numerical simulation. No. All the calculations were for bosonic models. No, no, all the calculations were for, uh, for there were bosonic models and there were fermionic models. The, the fermionic models were treated with dynamical fermions on a lattice, okay. and the lattice was the time lattice, or the temperature lattice, the, the, zero, the tau. What was the largest fermionic uh, space dimension? Like you had the 256 to the power. Uh, oh, okay. well, two of uh, them. In your, in your case, for the fermion. Uh, the, the 256 w would correspond. Times, times. Yeah, no, the, the n was the, the, it was 256 to the, uh, the fifties. 6 to the power of n squared minus 1, if yes. I remember correctly. Yes. Um, in your case, yes. It, well, the, it, the largest one that we treated was n is equal to uh, 16. But there was the 256 also. The 256 is hidden in the time parameter. This is gets replaced by a lattice in d tau which is integral from 0 to beta. And this one, this one lattice was approximated with lambda is equal to 48 and sometimes 96. And, and, but so many of these ones were smaller, I think, and typically 24. Though I think the ones I showed you had 24. And dynamical fermions? And some of these ones are both on but This one here had n is equal to uh, to see the transition here, I've done it for n equals 6. Uh, dynamical fermions are 6. And this has lambda equals 24. So the, it's dynamical fermions on it, 24. Uh, so there's 16 component fermions. The Dirac operator, so 16 times uh, n squared minus 1. Uh, times uh, lambda, and the matrix has degrees of freedom. And it means you have a, a, a representation of a Clifford algebra of the dimension for this number of Fermi degrees of freedom, just to understand no, no. what you do. No, no, no. These, the, what you do is you put these on, you. Uh, you represent them uh, by uh -huh. pseudo-fermions, which means you integrate the fermions out. You get a fa uh -huh. you get a fafian for okay. the fermions. Okay, just to understand. Yeah, no, no. You get a fafian for the fermions. You replace the fafian. By I should have said this. In fact, that uh, the, the computations were done in the phase quenched. You say that you assume that the fafian has no phase, so you replace it as the uh, the Fafian is the square root of a determinant yes. and you have integrated those out, so you, got, you have a square root of a determinant, um, you replace that up back into the action, so you have, you, what you have is you've got integral d of psi, e to the of psi, some of your lattice fermion, let me call it m of psi, this is the Fafian of M, and this is, you say this one is the determinant of M, dagger M to the one half, and you say, well, it's e to the i theta times, and you quench, ignore. Uh, so this determinant of uh, this quantity is uh, determinant uh, of m to the, sorry, I, I, I've done two, I've, I, there's no m dagger here, I'm taking, I'm jumping steps. Determinant, it's the determinant of m to the one half, yes. and it's the determinant, the modulus of that mm -hmm. times that. So this is determinant of m dagger m to the one quarter, yes. right? And you replace this, you say this one is 
uh, determinant of m dagger m to the minus one quarter with a minus one here. And you say this is an integral over xc uh, dagger dxc of e to the minus uh, half of a, the trace of xc dagger m dagger m to the minus one quarter xc. Okay. The xc are bosonic. The next, step is the, the next step is you say, well, actually, I don't need to compute this inverse uh, completely because I'm doing numerical work. Mm -hmm. So I can approximate it to the accuracy that I'm working with. So you say, ah, well, a rational approximation to something to the one quarter, x to the minus one quarter, I can, uh, if I know the range in which x is, I can approximate it by a rational approximation. So you use a rational approximation for that, and you reduce it to a linear problem, where you then uh, can uh, you get a you get something that involves an x, which will involve this matrix without powers in it, and you can solve a linear system for the, those ones. You shuffle the things backwards and forwards uh, to you, you build a Gaussian distribution for your xes. You solve your linear solver, feed them back in uh, to get your, your um, pseudo-fermions uh, that are equivalent to this and using those ones. So that's, that's, <laughs> okay. that's the technical details. I have some slides on it which are... Okay, okay. okay. Uh, just, just a last yes. question. Yes. Can you be yeah, a bit more precise about the resurgence you were speaking about? Like what kind of information do you expect uh, knowing that I mean, you were speaking about the fact that you had non-commutative manifolds for each saddle point. So what kind of information will resurgence give you in that case? Well, you see, there, if you know what the solutions for that, those saddle points are, then you would put those solutions back into the action functional that you're working with. And you would, you would have e to the minus that action. Mm -hmm. You would like to know a little bit more. You'd like to know the small fluctuations around that. Uh, so that you can compute a determinant, uh, the, you know, the, so that you have a proper Gaussian around that situation. And then uh, what resurgence tells you is that, that if I know these saddle points, um, sums over uh, those saddle points should be related to properties around a different saddle point. And the, the saddle point where, that we know where most of the physics is happening is around zero, but you can get much of the physics of around zero by knowing other saddle <coughs> points. And they often focus on complex saddle points. And there's, there's some very beautiful uh, work in, uh, in that along those directions. Uh, because once you tidy up the model, you can say, ah, let me test it in this particularly nice situation. Last question. Okay, so I was just curious. Uh, so Joachim told us about uh, some formulas that we can uh, use in commutators and so on that we can maybe compute, uh, say, geometric properties. So can you use some, something like this for, for these models? So, so you look at around the, the cell points, so you know, the, essentially the configuration that you find numerically. Can you somehow analyze some kind? The configuration we find numerically fits quite well around the, the the, um, the saddle points that descri are described by fuzzy spheres are zero vacua. Okay. Right? It doesn't help to, to also some compute um, some geometric... Uh... N not that I can see, but I mean, if you have further results around those saddle points, yes, then it probably would help. Uh, but to um, directly, uh, I don't see, see that. But the same type of question always arises. What if I'm wor Why work around a different saddle point than the one that's, that really is the steep, steepest descent? If, I've got a, if I'm going to do an, an ordinary integral, you can ask yourself, well, there, it can have many saddle points. I mean, the, there's the one that's, that's going to give me the steepest descent and it's going to give me a good approximation to it. But there can be information around other ones. Thank you very much. Yeah.